Welcome humanoids. It's episode 14 in our class on philosophy of climate change. It is Adam and Akbar, your guides on this learning odyssey. How you doing Akbar? Doing good? Good to see you. He's here to help us today. Uh, look, we are trying to understand climate change and I've been making an argument that it's more than just understanding the science and the facts. You have to know how all of that becomes enrolled into political processes where problems are contested and hopefully mitigated or resolved. So we're doing this problem-oriented inquiry and we're developing tools, models, heuristics, theories to think through what's going on with climate politics. And last time we looked at a theory of this, what we call the linear model or politics as applied science. We also noticed that uh, that often doesn't seem to actually map onto what's going on. So despite an increasing amount of science being produced, it seems like controversies around climate change persist and often gridlock persists. So what's going on? Let's develop another theory. This one we'll call the theory of climate politics as paradox. Akbar racks his brains, <laughs> okay. Um, what is a paradox? We're gonna to get to that in a second here. But I think this is a good way to think about it. In your notes, I put Thomas Kuhn's famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he talks about paradigm shifts or gestalt shifts, where you can see the world suddenly as something else. Is this a duck or a rabbit? Well, it's both and, and you can toggle between these different ways of seeing reality. How could something be rabbit and duck, A and not A? This is the stuff of paradox that we want to get into today. So keep this in mind um, because political reasoning, we're going to argue through this theory, is all about paradox. It's, a, it's about reality being seen in different ways, contradictory ways, but yet simultaneously existing in those ways. Okay, so here's what we want to do. My objective is just to describe and evaluate this theory of climate politics as paradox, and we'll compare it with the last theory we looked at. Quickly, we'll define paradox. We already gave you kind of this illustration of the duck rabbit. And then the meat of this talk will be building our theory. So we'll talk about paradox and politics in general. A couple of examples of it to give us something concrete to hang these abstract ideas on. And then we'll talk about paradox in environmental politics, so funneling down into climate change. And really the paradox is all about plurality. It's A and not A, A and B. So we're gonna talk about plurality in politics and plurality in science. And again, the linear model, the one we looked at last time is really about monarchy or oneness. The science will deliver the one picture of reality and everybody will come to the one consensus about that and arrive at the one policy decision we should come to. Um, this one's all about plurality, okay? Then we're gonna model it out as the iron triangle. Finally, like we did last time, we'll evaluate the theory. Strengths, weaknesses, the weaknesses will point us ahead to our third theory on propaganda or merchants of doubt. Okay, so this is Schrodinger's cat, uh, famous thought experiment about the cat that is simultaneously alive and dead. Um, so a paradox is not just a statement that's contrary to common belief, but it's a statement that seems self-contradictory, but it's actually not illogical or obviously untrue. The cat is alive and dead in this thought experiment. It's a duck and a rabbit. It's A and not A. This one I like, the man who wishes that wishes can't come true. If his wish is granted, his wish isn't granted. And if his wish isn't granted, his wish is granted. <laughs> this is a fun paradox. Um, so again, this is all about indeterminacy. It's about a plurality on a deep philosophic level. Really, this is about metaphysics and epistemology, as well as rhetoric and hermeneutics and interpretation, because it's about the way truth or reality appears or shines forth to people. And it's amazing if you think about it, the different realities that people inhabit, the way things can look so different to them. And this theory, I think, helps get at that. So a lot of this I'm getting from this wonderful book by Deborah Stone, a political theorist, um, about paradox and political reasoning. I've got five points here, maybe, from this book. This is a quote. Political reasoning, she says, is reasoning by metaphor and analogy. 
It's trying to get others to see a situation as one thing rather than another. We'll go through some examples in a bit. So it is the duck, it's not the rabbit, or it's the rabbit, it's not the duck, right? Paradox, she says, an essential feature of political life. So what she calls the rationality project, like the linear model or the applied science model, is bound to fail because this ideal of coming to the one description of reality just isn't the way political reasoning or politics happens. It's not the human condition on that level. So we have to understand politics as strategically crafted arguments designed to create paradoxes and then resolve them in a particular direction. Examples coming. She says, look, ultimately policymaking is a struggle over ideas and shared meaning. It's a struggle, struggle over our ideals and what they mean, like justice. Everybody's for justice, but what does it mean? And it's a struggle over the categories that exist in which things fit in which of these categories. It's a little bit like the old parable of the blind men, each feeling a different part of the elephant and one feels the leg and says, oh, it's a tree trunk. And one feels the tail and says, no, it's a rope. And one feels the ear and says, no, it's a fan. You know, all these different partial accesses to reality that is complex. So she says, political concepts are paradoxes. By logic, they must be mutually exclusive and they can't be living together like that. But by political reason, they're not. They are in fact living together. They're not mutually exclusive. Okay, now her book was written in 1988. So I thought I would update with some more recent examples. Um, right now it's become a big talking point from the current administration to talk about Democrat cities and the riots going on in Democrat cities. But note, that's a construction of a reality, right? That's a framing. And it's in contestation then with another framing, a long-standing framing that we don't actually have Democrat or Republican cities, we have American cities, right? What's going on with police brutality? Structural systemic racism or just bad apples, right? These are different ways of framing reality that become then contested. And, it, and key here, both sides can marshal evidence, arguments, science even, scientific studies, to support their way of framing reality, right? Um, guns are important for self-defense. Guns are dangerous and actually are counterproductive for self-defense. Which one? Um, what does law and order actually mean? You know, this is a phrase being used a lot. Many sides on the political spectrum want to use it, but they're gonna frame it and construct it in different ways. So those are non-climate related examples. And just to show that this is about political reasoning writ large, it's not just climate change. But I have this, I had you read a, uh, a story about climate change is more like diabetes. Um, that one, and then this one sort of builds off, it says it's more like diabetes than it is an asteroid coming to hit the earth. If it was an asteroid, so again, look, this is political reasoning by metaphor and analogy. What is climate change? What is it most like? Is it like an asteroid coming to hit earth? Well, in that case, we should drop everything. This is priority number one, and we need to change everything, right? So restructure the world, change, drop capitalism, all of that. Or is it more like diabetes? Look, it's chronic and it's a serious problem, but it's manageable and we can work through it with incremental tweaks to existing structures. And after all, that's all we can do anyways, right? So this captures a lot of the debate in the climate arena. And it's a debate about what is climate change? What's the best metaphor that we can use? And so they wanna construct this metaphor and then resolve things along their way of thinking. Okay, now let's keep going into environmental politics. This is another great book that helps me develop this theory. Um, environmental issues are complex, so just start there. We, we know that with climate change, right? Here's what he says next. This is John Dreisick, an environmental political theorist. The more complex a situation, the larger number of plausible, that's legitimate perspectives there can be on it, and it's harder and harder to prove them wrong because the more complex it gets, the more uncertainty there is, the more evidence and data there is floating around out there, the more there are opportunities to construct all that evidence and data in a way that aligns with your worldview, right? So discourse is his language, but I like worldview as maybe something more intuitive. So a discourse is a shared way of apprehending and making sense of the world. So for you, it will define common sense, legitimate knowledge. It's just the way that the world makes sense to you. 
and there's going to be assumptions and judgments under it. And these discourses both enable communication, because if you share these assumptions and judgments, it's easier to communicate even with sort of shorthand, like memes, for example. But they also constrain communication, because if you don't inhabit that same worldview, it can often be difficult to communicate across these different assumptions, right? And then he notes that very crucially, discourses are bound up with power. Some of them, some worldviews become hegemonic. That is, they become kind of this orthodox view that almost everybody believes in it, and the fundamental assumptions behind it are never or very rarely cast up for explicit thought. And we can become kind of thoughtlessly following along in this worldview. And a lot of what philosophers do is try to get us to stop and think about this hegemonic way of being in the world or thinking about the world. Okay. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but, but this is metaphysics, okay, what we're doing. Again, remember this rhizomatic image of the mode two inquirer or the climate philosopher? Oh my gosh, look at, in the middle of all of our science, we've got these profound philosophic questions. Dreisig goes through the history of environmental thinking in the US and he says, look, it used to be swamps and they were nasty things that needed to be drained and now they're wetlands and they should be protected. What are they? It was the frontier to be conquered and subdued, and now it's the wilderness to be protected. They were ornamental plants that we brought in, but now they're invasive species and we should get rid of them, right? Whales were resources. No, actually they're sentient creatures and we need to protect them. More recently, are those storm victims that we're looking at or are those climate refugees? What is it? Who are they, right? What is the environment or climate, right? Climate crisis, climate emergency, climate change. So contests over meaning are ubiquitous. This is the plurality that Arendt talked about, or one way to see that plurality in politics. What fuels these is basically, we don't have consensus on what evidence would matter, on what it would mean, on what standard we'd have to get to actually prove something. And in a nutshell, we don't really have consensus on what is a good life, what is a good society, what kind of world we want to build. We build these mm, worldviews, right? And often those form as political factions and it's difficult to get across those because both of them will marshal, marshal scientific evidence to support their worldview. And that's what I wanna get at now. So we see plurality in politics. Daniel Sarowitz, who I'm very fortunate to consider a friend and a mentor, one of the greatest thinkers I think on science policy. He says there's plurality in science as well, and it produces what he calls this wonderful turn of phrase, an excess of objectivity. So he says the linear model, it breaks down not because science, science fails to produce objective facts, but because it does that job too well. <laughs> it produces too many objective, legitimated, peer-reviewed facts. This is, remember we mentioned Thomas Hobbes, and he said when Boyle goes into his lab, and they're supposed to figure out what reality is, and then they pop out the other side of the lab and they're disagreeing with each other, we're still gonna see, says seeing double. This is the excess of objectivity. We're still seeing double. We're just seeing multiple realities. We're still seeing A and not A, rabbit and duck. So everyone's gonna marshal the science to legitimize their positions. And the most powerful interests, guess what? Are gonna win just as they would have done if science wouldn't have been involved in the conversation at all, right? Um, quote from one of his articles that I have linked in your notes. All of these books are linked in your notes. The scientific view of nature is sufficiently rich and diverse to support a diversity of strongly held and often conflicting political interests and public values. One way to see this diversity of science is the fields that we have. Geology will disagree with atmospheric chemistry in terms of fundamental models and methods. Molecular biologists will disagree with ecologists on these sort of deep epistemic levels, even metaphysical levels, about how they're constructing the worlds that they're trying to inquire into. Sarowitz at one point says, look, for heaven's sakes, we couldn't even agree on the ballot count for the 2000 US presidential election. <laughs> remember those, I don't know, many, many of you don't remember, but there was hanging chads, and did somebody vote, actually vote for Gore or Bush? We couldn't tell. So if we can't actually even count ballots, how are we supposed to come to agreement on something infinitely more complex like climate change? That's one way to see this. So Sarowitz ultimately, he's a geologist. He says, we should ditch the linear models 
physics or lab-based view of science where you parameterize everything, box it out and control it. He says, that's just not true to the kind of reality we have in our political lives. The scientific view we need is more geological or a field science view. Now, keep this in mind. This quote, he says, look, the problem is not one of good science versus bad or sound science versus junk science. The problem is nature can be viewed through many lenses. Just keep that in mind, because next time we're going to look at a theory that says, no, the problem is precisely good versus bad science. And the problem is precisely that junk science is displacing the sound science. Okay. Now, let's put our theory into one slide. The Iron Triangle. I'm getting this from Daniel Sirowitz, who has worked with Roger Pilkey, somebody I mentioned before, and others. You got politicians on the top, scientists on the right, advocates on the left. Here we are in the climate change political arena. And note, it's not a line, okay, like the linear model. It's going to be circular. Um, politicians say, "Boy, I'm taking a lot of heat. People want me to make different decisions, and I don't want to. I don't want to anger any of my constituents. Let's just find out what the science says about this. Because if the science gives me a clear message, then I can just sort of say, look, well, the science has spoken. I have to listen, right?" The scientists say, great, here's some money from politicians. I like that, I can do my research, I can contribute something meaningful to politics, and I can pursue the things I'm interested in pursuing. Now, here's the problem. Scientists produce an excess of objectivity, right? That gets fed into this advocacy process. Remember the decision process? You have intelligence, and then you have promotion leading to the prescription, the decision. Well, here we are in the promotion phase, and the advocates, guess what? They can look at all this diversity of scientific studies and findings, not to mention all of the uncertainties and the uncertainties about the uncertainties. And they can build a science-based narrative to suit their foregone conclusion, to suit their worldview. So you have all these multiple worldviews. They just pick up the science to use that as a base for what they've already believed in. And they all kind of use a linear model to say, look, science points to what we want. And they say, Here's what the politicians hear. <laughs> the science says A, and the science says not A, right? So the politicians then say, I wonder what the science really says, <laughs> right? And they go around this loop again and again and again. And here we are, stuck with a scientized political debate, everybody advocating for their values through the guise of objective science, which is not helpful. You get stuck in gridlock. It perpetuates whatever status quo you've got in place. Okay. Briefly, evaluating the strengths of this. Well, it accounts for things that the linear model misses or misconstrues, especially the plurality of sciences with an S on the end, sciences, right? It offers a more realistic role for science or roles for science, okay? Not predictive certainty that's gonna be an irrefutable basis for action. That's just asking too much of science. But science can alert us to problems. Scientists can associate what they find with a range of policy alternatives available to us, and they can say which ones are consistent or inconsistent with what they're seeing. And science, science can help guide action after we've reached a political consensus. So we have to have this explicit values discussion. And then we can sort of use science once we've come up with consensus to see how well we're doing on the path we wanna be following. Um, so there's a real dangers of scientizing politics, arguing our values, from behind science so that we never actually get to the fundamental values disagreements that are driving everything. This theory does a good job of highlighting all that. But turning now to our next lecture, beware the false equivalency that might come out of this model. Just because you can see a situation as A and not A, duck or rabbit, it doesn't mean that A and not A are equally valid or legitimate characterizations, okay? What about junk science? What if not A is based on some special interests that have cooked up some fake news story that's all bad faith or just bad arguments? It shouldn't get equal airtime or equal weight with A, right? What about motivated reasoning and confirmation bias and all of these things that can lead to basically junk science or junk conclusions? That's really important. And this model tends to just set that to the side so that's not really what's going on. Well, sometimes that's really what's going on. I mean, here's an example from recent uh, times when I'm recording this. The claim that the CDC 
has adjusted the deaths from the coronavirus from 153,000 down to 9,000. Well, I won't go into the details of this. I've got this linked here and I'll put it in your notes. This is just good old fashioned BS, right? It's a bad faith, bad argument, or maybe it's newfangled BS because it's happening via Twitter in the media sphere that we're talking about that helps to perpetuate all of these worldviews that may not have anything good underneath them, but they've got a whole lot there. And even if it's junk, it doesn't seem to matter in terms of propping up people's worldviews, right? So some spin is just too much. It's lies, it's half-truths, it's distortions, it's dis disinformation. So it's not all equally legitimate and shouldn't all get equal airtime, right? That's what this last of our third theories we'll talk about, we'll get to merchants of doubt and uh, what I'm calling climate politics is propaganda. Okay, so that's a look ahead. For now though, um, Akbar, our pun machine says, paradox, <laughs> this whole time, I thought you were talking about my pair of docs, of course, his favorite shoes. All right, on that really bad joke, uh, we will end and uh, until next time, may the force be with you. <laughs>